Last year, we started a series that we entitled Devoted, based on Acts 2, verse 42, which says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And we spent nine weeks looking at the subject of prayer and what it means to be devoted to prayer. We looked at the privilege we have of coming before our Father, our generous Father who is in heaven. We talked about how uh, how we approach our Heavenly Father in prayer, in humility, hallowed be his name, uh, in submission to his will and his purposes, and of course with thanksgiving and praise in our hearts. We talked about the importance of praying out of right relationships, making sure that we don't have any unforgiveness in our hearts and we we shared about what it means to pray in the name of Jesus and the, 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 the power that is in the name of Jesus. We talked about the, that powerful weapon that prayer is and the necessity of intercessory prayer. We talked about praying without ceasing, not just to pray at the start and end of our days, but to pray our way through the day. And of course, we talked about how uh, fasting can be so powerful when it is linked with prayer. And then, of course, we concluded with Pastor Tim Jack sharing about getting the hymn book out and having praise in prayer to see breakthrough and release these chains that bind us. And all that's available for you to go over on our YouTube channel. And a couple of weeks ago, Chris Williams started talking about what it means to be devoted to fellowship. And over the coming weeks and months, he'll be unpacking that and sharing a lot more of what that means. And in parallel to that, I'll also be taking uh, the theme of what it means to be devoted to the breaking of bread. So what does it mean to devote ourselves to the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread, of course, refers to the Last Supper that Jesus shared with his disciples on the night he was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. We know this as communion, the symbols of bread and wine that symbolize the body of Jesus given for us and the blood of Jesus shed for us. We share communion, we break bread in remembrance of him in remembrance of Jesus. Devoting ourselves to the breaking of bread has to mean more than simply remembering Jesus' body and blood in a regular act of communion. It has to mean more than just being devoted to taking communion on a regular basis. So what we are in effect remembering when in, the, in this act of breaking bread together is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so over the coming weeks and months, we'll be looking a little deeper into what Jesus accomplished for us in the cross and therefore what we are remembering in the symbols of his body and his blood. So to begin this section of teaching on being devoted to the breaking of bread, let's turn to 1 Corinthians and chapter 1, and we're going to read from verses 18 through 25, and Lottie is going to read this to us. Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, 
both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lottie. And may God add a blessing to the reading of his word. The cross. Foolishness to those who are perishing. Power and wisdom of God to those who are being saved. The cross divides opinion. It all comes down to what you believe about what happened to a man called Jesus 2,000 years ago, whose birth we recently celebrated at Christmas. Jesus was crucified on a cross. That is a historical fact. Jesus died on a cross. Again, that is a historical fact. And um, But the question is, was it just another man being crucified, put to death by the Roman Empire, and therefore end of story, or was there more to it? The account of the death of Jesus is well documented. And while most historical accounts uh, documented the death of Jesus after he had died, one of the things that ought to make us sit up and think is that it was actually documented uh, 700 years before Jesus was even born. Isaiah 53 talks about the suffering servant. It says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our sufferings, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. This is a description of what happened in the death of Jesus. And it gives us the reason why Jesus died. He didn't die because he was deserving of death. He died for our pain. He died for our suffering. He died for our sin. He died for all of our iniquity. And in verse 10 of Isaiah 53, it says these amazing words, Yet... It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. What? It was planned? God knew about this? This was God's will for this to happen? Yes. Peter also affirms this and declares it to the thousands of people listening to him in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, where he says in Acts 2 verse 23, Jesus was handed over by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. 
You see, the death of Jesus was not just about Jesus dying on a cross for our sin, for our iniquity, for our pain and suffering. It was a, If it was just about Jesus dying for those things, that would indeed be foolishness if it ended there. No, there had to be a higher purpose. And the verses that we read from Isaiah 53 start to explain it. He died so that we might be healed. He died so that we might have peace. And it doesn't end there. We have to read on in Isaiah 53 from verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand after he has suffered. He will see the light of life and be satisfied and by his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities therefore i will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils among the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors the death of jesus was necessary to satisfy the wrath of god on sin and god punished jesus for all of our sin all of our iniquity jesus became sin and god punished all of sin in the person of jesus but the story does not end with the death of Jesus because after he died he was buried and on the third day he rose again as it said in Isaiah 53 after he had suffered he will see the light of life and will justify many now it all begins to make sense now we understand the plan of God why it pleased the Lord to crush him and cause Jesus to suffer because the death because with the death of Jesus came the punishment of sin, which through that belief in Jesus means that we do not now need to know that punishment because Jesus has already paid the price. Sin has been dealt with and the consequences of sin, therefore, which is death, has been defeated for Jesus rose from the dead and lives forevermore. A way has been made. For people like us who have sinned, we can now look at the cross and believe that Jesus died for us and so receive forgiveness. We receive peace with God. We are healed. The cross is foolishness if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. But it is the power of God and the wisdom of God to those who believe that Jesus died and rose because those people put their trust in Jesus, whoever lives to intercede for them because they believe what God accomplished for them through Jesus on the cross. In Luke 24, after Jesus had risen from the dead, uh, he appeared to two men walking along the Emmaus road. And, it, and he says in verses 25 through 27, Jesus says to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer all these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself that would have been amazing and uh, indeed it records that uh, their hearts burned within them while jesus was speaking to them of course it all made sense it was all there for all to see they just hadn't realized it until that moment according to some bible scholars there are around 351 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in Jesus. And if Jesus fulfilled just 
eight of them. The probability of that happening has been calculated at one chance in a very big number that I can't pronounce that you'll see along the bottom of your screen. <laughs> the mathematical chances that a person could fulfill all of them is one chance in a trillion 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 wow that is a really really big number but jesus did fulfill them all because jesus is the messiah he really is who he said he is the son of the living god and he died for our sin and he and after he defeated death and hades he rose to show that we can have life and life everlasting the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing who don't believe that but the power of god and the wisdom of god to those being saved who do believe it even in the death of Jesus, the seven things that he said on the cross tell us a story of what it was all about. It was about grace, receiving what we do not deserve, which is the offer of forgiveness. When Jesus says in Luke 23 verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. It was about hope. The promise that through knowing Jesus, that through Jesus knowing that when we die, we will be with him forever. Where he says in Luke 23 verse 43, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was about compassion, where we see Jesus uh, on the cross not thinking about himself, but about others. Jesus had you and I in his thoughts. And we see this exemplified where Jesus says to his mother in John 19, 26 through 27, woman, here is your son. And to his disciple, one of his disciples, here is your mother. It was about desolation, where that intimate relationship between Jesus and the Father was broken so that we could be reconciled to God. Jesus cries out in Matthew 27 verse 46, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was about fulfillment because Jesus was in torment. He was in agony because he was paying the full price of our sin. When he says in John 19, 28, I am thirsty. Jesus was literally at that point receiving the full wrath of God on our behalf. This was to fulfill the will of God. Jesus took that punishment so we wouldn't have to. And it was about victory. Because in taking all that punishment for our sin on the cross, Jesus won the victory over sin. Because sin could no longer reign in the lives of people who put their trust in him. Jesus cries out in John 19.30, it is finished. And finally it was about trust. Trusting that God will catch us when we die. Jesus telling us to follow him, not to be afraid of death. For it's not a full stop, it's just a comma. For Jesus knew that he would rise again. And so he says in Luke 23 verse 47, Father into your hands. I commit my spirit. So even in the words of Jesus on the cross, the plan and purpose of God is all there. The cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, who don't believe what Jesus was accomplishing for them on the cross. But it's the power of God and it's the wisdom of God who do believe that everything Jesus did on the cross, he did for them and i believe it i believe that jesus did that for me and so i have received grace and forgiveness i have hope of eternal life i know that he thought of me on that cross and was separated from his father so that i could be reconciled i am now more than a conqueror through him who loves me and gave himself for me. Sin no longer reigns in me. And one day when my life is over, 
I will go to live forever with Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why am I telling you all this? Well, the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21, explain it perfectly. Christ's love compels me because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. The ones who regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. I'm sharing with you the message that you can be reconciled to God through the cross. Just like I have been and many, many others beside. The cross is a demonstration of the love of Jesus that while, while we were still sinners, he died for us. He died so that we might live, not just in this life, but in the life to come. And he proved it by rising from the dead. And through trust, through belief in Jesus and what he accomplished in his death and his resurrection, you too can be reconciled to God. You can be forgiven of the sin that separates you from God. But how do we do that? Well, Peter explains it in Acts 2, verses 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, we have to repent, which simply means we have to stop going our own way and start going God's way. We need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, that which simply means that we have to believe in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus and ask to be forgiven of our sin. And the gift we receive is the Holy Spirit, who is life himself and the guarantee of the hope we now have of eternal life forever with Jesus. It's that simple. The cross it's foolishness to those who are perishing, but the power and wisdom of God to those who are being saved. How do you view the cross? Is it still foolishness to you? Or is it the power and wisdom of God? Does it now make sense to you? And just in these moments, I want to offer an opportunity to respond to God. And I sometimes find a physical response either with my hands raised to God or my hand on my heart to be helpful as I focus in responding to God. And if you want to receive this power and wisdom of God for salvation, then I'm just going to say a prayer and you can repeat the words after me. They'll also be on the screen. And if you already know salvation in Jesus, then you too can respond. By just taking these moments to allow the love of God to once more touch your life as you remember all that Jesus has done for you and won for you on the cross. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for my sin. I'm sorry for everything that I've done wrong against you. Please forgive me. I choose to go your way. Come into my life and make me new. I welcome your Holy Spirit into my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
And if you said that prayer, I want to welcome you into God's family. There are angels rejoicing in heaven over that decision that you've just made. And at the end of the service, you will see some details of where you can contact us. And we'd love to be able to hear from you so that we can connect with you and uh, help you uh, on as you start this journey, or this adventure with Jesus. And it is a life of great joy and great peace. Yes, there are loads of challenges ahead, but it's a life worth living because it's a life with Jesus. So my prayer is that all of us will know the reality of the cross, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The Lord bless you.